As Andres mentioned, I'm leading the cardiovascular biology group, so we are essentially interested in developing novel biotherapeutics for these diseases, and I'm also the scientist in charge of the bioexperimentation facility, so together with Andres, we are managing uh, most of the vivo experiments uh, that we perform here at ICPB. And today, um, I'll give you two presentations. First one focused on gene transfer in general, so we will uh, go through an overview of the methods that we currently have available to deliver nuclei acids in vivo. And then we will focus more on the process of a new blood vessel formation and why it is important, what we can do playing with the prone antiandrogenic molecules. So the idea of uh, transferring nucleic acid, which is uh, the subject of uh, gene transfer technologies, is uh, at the center of uh, gene therapy, which uh, uh, consider genes uh, as drugs, if you want. So the idea is uh, to transfer nucleic acids, which means uh, uh, coding genes, cDNA, but also small RNA, for instance, to treat uh, various diseases. And while um, this uh, discipline uh, was born thinking at replacing the function of missing genes for the therapy of uh, monogenic diseases where you have uh, a genetic uh, defect uh, leading to uh, the lack of a cellular function, actually uh, the field uh, has moved also to uh, treat uh, complex disorders. And this is just to show you that uh, gene therapy now is uh, a reality and uh, it uh, is in the clinics, although most of the study are still in phase one, one, two, aiming at uh, proving the safety uh, rather than the efficacy of the therapy, but there are some niches, some specific diseases that uh, are currently well treated by gene therapy, and this is uh, the gold standard for a few diseases, so we will go through some of these applications. You are aware that there is a plethora of methods to transfer uh, genes into cells. I remember um, one of the first congresses I went at the American Society of Gene Therapy. Uh, there was an interview to um, James Wilson and they asked him what's the major problem of, of gene therapy? And he said, well, actually we are facing three major problems. First one is delivery, second one is delivery, and third one is delivery. Because this is actually the main problem to convince a foreign DNA to enter into, into a cell. And various methodologies have been uh, uh, developed and tested, including both uh, non-viral methods, uh, so uh, some cells are able to spontaneously uptake uh, naked DNA, chemical methods, physical methods, However, the only uh, method that actually works in vivo exploits viral vectors. Why viruses? Because uh, if you look at the evolution of the viruses, they have evolved to do exactly what gene therapy wants to do. They uh, are uh, microorganisms that are able to target specific cells, uh, enter into the cell, and bring their genetic information into the nucleus and then force the cell to express what they are called for. And this is exactly what we want to do when we aim at doing gene therapy. So if we look at the various uh, 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 delivery methods, actually what is in the clinic, 70% is based on viruses. And these are essentially the major viral types that we can exploit and genetically modify using genetic engineering to turn them into viral vectors. So what does it mean to, trans to turn a virus into a vector? Essentially deleting most of the viral genes that are often responsible of diseases and replace them with a therapeutic gene that we can put under the control of uh, an artificial promoter in some instances. Other instances, uh, such as the uh, retroviruses, uh, we often use the LTR of the virus that um, functions as, as a promoter. And this is an electron microscopy showing, showing a retrovirus that is able to fuse its membrane with the cell membrane and enter and transfer the genetic uh, information. So each of these classes actually 
has advantages and disadvantages, retroviruses and uh, vectors derived from HIV, so-called antiviruses, have the potential to integrate uh, their genetic information into the host genome uh, because uh, they are RNA virus that are retrotranscribed to DNA and then uh, they have a mechanism for integration and this allows permanent um, uh, integration and expression of uh, uh, the therapeutic gene into the target cells and also its progeny. Other viruses such as adenoviruses and AAV, and we will uh, shortly talk about them, don't integrate, uh, so they are preferred for um, cells where you want either a transient expression or um, a persistent expression in uh, um, quiescent non-dividing cells. So, um, Historically, the first viruses that were exploited to treat diseases uh, as uh, gene therapy approaches were based on both retroviruses and adenoviruses, and uh, these uh, were increasingly used, adenoviruses, uh, but then eventually in uh, uh, 1999, a tragic event occurred because the use of these adenoviral vectors led to the death of a guy who was enrolled in a trial for um, the therapy of uh, a disease which is called OTC deficiency, ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, leading to uh, uh, neurological uh, symptoms and mental uh, retardation. And the uh, cause of it that was exactly the use of the first generation of the noviral vectors. And this uh, is uh, why we recognize that these uh, vectors are highly inflammatory, because these vectors actually elicited a very potent inflammatory response against the viral vector that led to the, to the death of, uh, of these guys. So, Eventually, uh, adenoviral vectors now are very rarely considered for human therapy, and the only niche of diseases in which they find an application is cancer, because in cancer you want to induce inflammation and activation of the immune system, and in particular, a, 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 var a variant of adenoviral vector has been established to produce so-called oncolytic vectors. So normally when a cell is infected by a wild type adenovirus, it produces these two key viral proteins, E1A, which activate the cell cycle and activate the transcriptional machinery of the cell in order to force the cell to produce abundant new viral um, particles. And at the same time, this uh, induces a P53 response that would lead the cell toward apoptosis, but the virus also produces E1B protein that interacts with P53 and inhibits P53. So this is a strategy that the virus evolved in order to produce new viral particles and undergo effective viral cycle progression. So the idea of having an oncolytic vector is uh, to have a vector that produces E1A protein but is missing E1B. So in a normal cell, this results in activation of cell cycle transcription, but induces a P53 response. And since uh, these uh, oncolytic vectors don't have E1B that inactivate P53, normal cells infected by these vectors undergo apoptosis. In contrast, cancer cells that often lack P53 don't have this pro-apoptotic response, and so these uh, oncolytic vectors are only able to effectively replicate and spread themselves uh, in cancer cells uh, that are P53 deficient. So these uh, uh, viruses have been shown to be effective not much if used by themselves, but much more effective when used in combination with other chemotherapy agents, such as fluorouracil. The prototype of these vectors is uh, Onyx O15, very widely used in, uh, in China, for instance, less in other countries. 
The other category of vectors that have uh, been used uh, since the beginning of gene therapies were those based on uh, retroviral uh, retroviruses. And this uh, was um, uh, made the case of one of the first uh, clinical success of gene therapy for the treatment of this uh, uh, severe immunodeficiency, which is called skid x one so SCID means a severe combined immunodeficiency, and what does this mean? It means that most of the cells of the immune systems are lacking. Why? Because in these patients, what is missing is the genetic information that encodes for this gamma chain here in yellow, which is a subunit of a receptor that binds a variety of interleukins that are essential for the development of most of the white blood cells in our immune system. So these uh, uh, boys that have these genetic defects are called the bubble boys because they don't have an immune system, they are very susceptible to any kind of infection, and they have to live in these uh, protective bubbles, uh, not allowed to uh, get in contact with any human um, person, not even their, their parents. So, you can imagine what kind of life they, they, they must have. So what was the idea behind the gene therapy for this disease? Well, once we were able to harvest hematopoietic stem cells, which is the common practice used for bone marrow transplantation, then we got the idea to use retroviral vectors to insert the missing gene into the hematopoietic cells. So since retroviral vectors are able to integrate the genetic information the gene is able to integrate itself in the uh, hematopoietic stem cells and so repopulate a bone marrow which uh, express the missing, uh, the missing gene. And this is exactly what happens, so using a retroviral vectors to transduce uh, bone marrow stem cells of these guys, and this uh, resulted in this uh, uh, paper that I show you here in Science. Nine boys out of nine cured. They were able to go to school, get out of the bubble, play with kids, uh, and have a normal life. So this uh, was really a big success for the gene therapy, probably the, the, the first uh, big success. But then, two years later, first uh, uh, case of uh, leukemia induced by these viruses, so one of the nine boys uh, developed a leukemia uh, like uh, disease, and most of the trials uh, were halted worldwide. Then, a few months later, second kit, same group of patients, also developing a very similar form of leukemia. So this uh, put all the trials on hold. This was the, um, in Italy, but eventually what we understood was that this was a very peculiar case for this disease, because when uh, we were, uh, actually, we, when the, the community were searching for the place where the virus is as integrated, they discovered that most of the retroviral vectors integrated close to an oncogene, which is called LMO2. And so what happened in this leukemia case is was a cooperation in the uh, um, tumoral transformation between the gamma chain, which per se is an oncogene because it induces the proliferation of uh, white blood cells, which is essential for the production of most of the immune system, and when it was put close to the LMO2, the LTR of the vector also induced the overexpression of LMO2. And so the overexpression of both oncogenes induced the leukemia. So this is something that exists. However, most of the kids that develop leukemia actually were subjected to a normal bone marrow transplantation and they survived. So for a, for a disease that has no cure, probably a risk, a 10% risk of leukemia that is still curable by an hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is an acceptable risk. So this is still considered a, a useful and uh, um, wor worth an option for these kids. And this is uh, not going to happen if uh, we are going to use the same strategy to treat other diseases in which the transgene is not an oncogene, because in this case we are not going to drive any uh, proliferation uh, over uh, non-transduced cells. 
and indeed other forms of immunodeficiency, such as, for instance, the deficit of uh, adenodeaminase. If we go back to this scheme, you see that another missing gene leading to the uh, severe combined immunodeficiency is uh, ADA, aminodeaminases, and uh, now we have uh, a huge experience also gene therapy using these uh, uh, for this disease, and here no leukemia has never developed. So uh, leukemic uh, events are probably connected to the uh, skid x one because of the oncogenic potential of the gamma chains. And then based on this success, a researcher whose name is uh, Luigi Naldini, at the time he was a postdoc uh, at the SOC Institute, uh, now he is a professor at San Raffaele Hospital in Milan, had the idea of uh, using HIV as a background uh, for uh, developing uh, uh, viral vectors for gene therapy. And uh, if you remember the taxonomy of retroviruses, they are divided in the gamma retroviruses that uh, produce uh, fast infection and lengthy viruses that uh, instead uh, um, uh, uh, interact in a uh, more uh, um, slow uh, manner with the host, so uh, they induce disease in a very long term. And uh, these are more, more complex diseases, and the major difference uh, with retroviral vectors is that they can also transduce and transfer genes in cells that don't divide. So they can be used also to transduce neurons uh, and other cell types that are quiescent. These uh, vectors, lentiviral vectors, are perfectly suited for uh, the combination of cell and gene therapy. So we have already talked about the use of retroviruses to uh, uh, stably transfer genes in hematopoietic stem cells. Lentiviral vectors have been successfully used, for instance, to, to genetically correct defects that lead to um, uh, unhealthy and uh, um, uh, fragile skin. You know that uh, in our skin we also have uh, uh, a population of stem cell that uh, constantly renew the various layers of uh, our epidermis. And there is a technology to grow um, uh, sheets of uh, keratinocytes derived from uh, epidermal stem cells. These technologies are also developed in uh, uh, Italy, in Modena, by Michele De Luca. And last year in Nature, this uh, paper clearly uh, proved that uh, lentiviral mediated gene therapy can be combined with this uh, cell therapy to restore missing functions in uh, epithelial cells. This is a case of a kid that was uh, um, born with a defect uh, uh, leading to epidermolysis uh, bullosa, so dermal junctions were completely absent, and he was losing his skin, essentially. You see that he was completely de-epithelized, uh, very prone to infection, and uh, when he reached 80% of uh, lack of skin, actually he was going to die, so nobody knew what to do, and they decided to approve uh, this uh, compassionate use of gene therapy, so what was possible to do was to harvest uh, a few clones of uh, epidermal stem cells from the 10% of skin that he was still having, induce uh, uh, the expression of the a missing gene using a lentiviral vector, and then produce uh, meters of uh, transgenic skin that was transplanted uh, to this patient. And the transplant was really successful, and after one month, uh, he had a complete recovery of uh, his skin with the corrected uh, uh, gene defect. So uh, this uh, led us to say that actually gene therapy is uh, getting uh, the therapy of choice for a variety of diseases. And the last class of uh, vectors I want to mention and quickly discuss with you is uh, uh, the one based on adeno-associated virus. This is a more recent class of virus, uh, but this is what uh, we love here in ICGP because uh, they offer a lot of advantages that are getting them the most uh, widely used uh, vectors uh, in the clinics and also in animal models now. If you go to a gene therapy meeting now, 90% of the applications are based 
on AV. Why? Because um, they derive from this uh, parvovirus uh, that is this unfortunate name. It's called adeno-associated, but it doesn't, anything, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with adeno vector. Uh, it has this name because it has been originally discovered as a contaminant of an adenoviral preparation. Here there is this uh, electron microscopy showing an adenoviral particle, and here around these small rounds, it's AV. And why is this? Because this is a defective uh, vector, sorry, virus, it is not able to replicate itself in the absence of a co-infection by a helper virus, which can be adeno or herpes. And by itself, it is very diffuse. 80% of us do have antibody against AV, but it has never been associated to any human disease, so it's very safe. And uh, uh, it has a very simple genome. It only has two genes, rep and cap, they can be completely removed from the backbone and replaced with a therapeutic gene with a promoter of choice. So viral vectors don't have any viral genes, so they are not uh, inflammatory, very poorly immunogenic. And they are very effective in transducing quiescent cells, post-mitotic cells, cells that don't replicate. They work perfectly in skeletal muscle, heart, neurons, cells in the retina. And these are the cells that are lost in most of neuro, not neuro, most of degenerative conditions in general. Tissues that are not able to regenerate in, during aging are going to degenerate. So these are the vectors of choice to treat any kind of degenerative condition. First successful use is for eye diseases. There is a special form of retinitis pigmentosa that leads to uh, abundant retinal degeneration due to mutation in a protein which is called RPE65. This form is called liver congenital amaurosis. This is what happens to this patient. They first uh, lose their peripheral vision and then they uh, lose progressively the vision in a concentric way getting completely blind. And again, there is a mouse model and a big and anim large animal model of these diseases. This is essential to go to the clinic. First, I have to, to have a mouse model, and then possibly, as we already heard yesterday from Fabio, have a large model. In this case, for the leber congenital amaurosis, both exist. And I remember at the time I was at the same Congress, uh, there was this uh, first uh, movie project in which you had this uh, blind dogs that were treated unilaterally with an AV vector encoding the missing genes in one of their eyes. And they were um, uh, put in a room with a lot of obstacles uh, and uh, they were uh, uh, going to the obstacles uh, on the untreated side, where, whereas they were perfectly able to avoid any obstacle on the treated, uh, on the treated side. So, there was a stand innovation in, in the room, and this led to three clinical trials. Um, I'll quickly show you here, but we will have to go, well, maybe I can show you later the movie if you are uh, interested, that there were actually people that were blind that after the treatment were able to see again and, and, and understand where the objects were and, and so on. So this uh, is... Uh, the first evidence that this kind of uh, genetic forms of blindness can be treated, particularly if we will be able to anticipate the treatment at an early age. The problem is here is the cost, because these uh, gene therapy approaches are still very expensive, and so it is um, not very clear who is going to pay for that. Uh, and, and, and this is probably something also that uh, should, be, should be discussed uh, more extensively, uh, not just the efficacy of, this, of these therapies. Another successful story is hemophilia, but for the sake of time, I think I will skip this, uh, just to mention that uh, there are hemophilic patients that uh, are now free from uh, transfusions uh, and infusions of recombinant factors because the missing genetic uh, uh, function can be uh, stably uh, provided by AV vectors uh, transducing, the, transducing the liver. And this maybe I also can uh, talk to you later uh, when we will discuss about the 
blood vessels. This is another successful story of gene therapy, not yet in the clinic, but very close to exploiting again AV vectors. You know that uh, uh, muscular dystrophies are quite quietly diffuse uh, uh, muscle diseases that can be caused by various uh, um, gene defects and the classic form, the most uh, uh, characterized, uh, studied and uh, uh, diffuse form are uh, those uh, missing the function of dystrophin, which is uh, a protein that uh, links uh, actin filaments, <coughs> so the cytoskeleton, to the extracellular matrix through this uh, uh, glycoprotein complex that uh, uh, binds the dystrophin on one side and uh, uh, um, the basal membrane proteins on the other side. So this is the shape of dystrophin. You know the dystrophin is the largest gene that we have. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it contains 70 exons, the mRNAs is uh, 14,000 base pairs, so we will never be able to pack this uh, into a vector, particularly into AV. I told you that uh, AV is a parvovirus, it's very small, and it has a cloning capacity of 4 KB. So we are far from the cloning capacity of this vector. But once we understand that the major function of the dystrophin is to connect acting with the, the dystrophin complex uh, at the cellular membrane, and this uh, intermediate domain is not so essential as shown by the two major phenotype, phenotype of the disease uh, induced by dystrophy mutation. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is uh, due to genetic defects uh, that uh, cause uh, complete loss of function of the protein, so the protein is truncating, you don't have dystrophin complete with uh, this uh, C-terminal domain. And this, uh, uh, render the protein unable to exert its linking function. In contrast, Baker form of the disease um, is caused by mutation in this uh, central part, which still preserve uh, the N and C terminal domains. So the protein is shorter, but can still exert uh, its linking function. So the idea was to have a reduced form of the dystrophin cDNA called microdystrophins or mini dystrophins uh, that still contain the N terminus, the C terminus, but have a short uh, central part uh, of the protein. And this can be packed into AV, and it has been used to treat uh, uh, dogs, which has more or less uh, the size uh, of uh, uh, a kid. So showing that uh, the therapy may, may be useful. This is a dystrophic dog. Again, we have mouse model, we have dog's model. This is a dog dystrophic, it cannot walk, it cannot jump. Even if you show it the food, it cannot go over. So you really see that it's weak and it uh, nicely reproduces the weakness of the kids, dystrophic kids. This is treated with an AAV, coding for a microdystrophin. You immediately see that it can run and you, it sh you show it some food, it can quickly jump. This is... Uh, the comparison with an untreated dog and another one that has been treated, you can clearly see the recovery of muscular function. It's really impressive. So this is something that we should be able to achieve uh, uh, in, a, in a boy. And again, the amount of the problem of the muscular dystrophy is the amount of vector you need to treat uh, all the muscles. But this uh, indicates that it is, it is indeed feasible. These are again two other examples uh, treated one with a high dose, the other with a low dose, and you, you see the difference. Eh? This is something that a, a dystrophic dog would have never been able to do, stand on its posterior uh, uh, limbs. And these are low dose. So low dose is not effective. This indicates again that we really have uh, to produce a lot of viruses and have facilities that can uh, uh, produce uh, uh, large-scale viral batches. And this, uh, um, again, this is uh, 1921 months. So this is the indication that one treatment can last uh, for months, possibly throughout the life, because muscle cells uh, don't proliferate, at least don't proliferate extensively uh, in, if you don't damage them. 
and so um, it probably uh, will be affected. And this is one dog that uh, had an accidental fracture. It was treated with a high dose, so it has to be immobilized for a while, possibly also inducing some uh, regeneration of the muscle, and it is uh, still cured. So it can jump, it can, it can do this exercise that is impossible, as mentioned, for antritic drop. Last concept I want to leave you with is the possible misuse of uh, gene transfer. So every time we have the Olympic game, we hear about the possibility of using these uh, methodologies to boost uh, the muscular function, to enhance uh, the athletic performance of athletes, typical uh, gene that uh, we may want to either inhibit or produce are genes that regulate the production of myostatin, that is a gene that blocks uh, the growth of the muscle mass. This has been discovered um, when we realized that there was a, a, a species of uh, uh, cows called the, this uh, Belgian blue that have a very uh, large muscle mass and they have no fat in their mass. So this is very um, prestigious and constantly meet if you go to eat them. Uh, and they, it was immediately discovered that this phenotype is due to mutation in the myostatin gene. And so we discovered the function of myostatin in reducing both the proliferation and differentiation of satellite cells that are uh, muscle progenitors. And this was clearly reproduced in uh, transgenic mice uh, when by inhibiting the production of myostatin, you increase the muscle mass, and if you have a double transgenic that of overexpressed polystatin, which is a natural inhibitor of myostatin, you have further enhancement of muscle growth. So this is something we are also working on because the same laboratories that use gene transfer for therapy, of course, are invited to think about possible strategies to detect a possible misuse of therapy. Now we know more and more about genes that somehow influence our athletic performance, but also intelligence, aesthetics, and so we can consider using these technologies also in a, in a not proper medical way. I'm not going to talk about genome editing because I know that uh, excellent speakers will introduce you so, but this just to mention that with this uh, uh, technology in mind, we can even think at curing dominant disease, not just recessive disease, and also doing so in, uh, in utero. So this was just to introduce another course that we're going to organize in October, not to just providing skills on the use of the technology, but also thinking at possible um, uh, ethical and bioethical implication. And with this, uh, I think I'll stop. We still have uh, maybe, uh, no, I think we don't have time for questions, but maybe we can, okay, as you wish. <laughs> Thank you.